program this morning, the Mountaineer Farm Talk. My name is JJ Barrett, and I'm the Extension Agent for Agriculture for WVU Extension in Wood County. And of course, my co-host, uh, John David Johnson. Hello, hello. And I've got uh, Evan Wilson. So we wanna welcome our guest today, uh, Dr. Rakesh Chandron. He is our uh, WVU weed specialist or IPM specialist. And of course, we have Bruce Lloyd. He is extension agent over in uh, Lewis County for a while. He's been there for a while. Um, this week, um, oh, I just wanted to um, put a plug in here for our next few programs. Um, May 21st, we have Dr. Lewis Jett, our horticulture specialist, heirloom vegetables for the garden, and then uh, Friday, May 28th, uh, Dr. Carlos Quesada, our entomology specialist, will be talking about spring pests in the garden. Um, like I said, uh, Rakesh has, uh, um, okay, uh, let's start with, uh, um, first with Bruce. He's the, um, Bruce, how long have you been with Extension here? It'd be uh, 29 years here in West Virginia. 29 years. Oh, that's right. You were in, that's right. You're in Penn State. What, uh, tell us a little bit about your, about your background, Bruce. I'm from uh, Barber County originally and went to Virginia Tech to school, got my bachelor's degree at Virginia Tech and then went to Penn State and got my master's and right out of graduate school then I started to work for Penn State Extension in uh, Washington County. So I worked in, I was actually in four counties, Washington Green, Fayette and Allegheny. That's the Southwest corner there southwest of Pittsburgh. So I worked there for four years, working with dairy farmers primarily and, and forage crops. And then in 1992, I came back home basically um, um, to Lewis County. I've been in Lewis County ever since uh, I started back in West Virginia since 92. All right, and, uh, and uh, Bruce also heads up our organizing our pesticide trainings that we do across the state of West Virginia. And he is very familiar with uh, um, doing those videos all about um, dealing with with uh, chemical control. We're, we're talking about pests. Uh, Dr. Rakesh Chandron. Rakesh, how long have you been with Extension? So I came here, WVU 1999, JJ. So Great. this is my 22nd year. All right. Um, and can you give us a little background, um, what your, um, as far as agricultural background? and? Sure, yeah. So... Uh, I grew up in India, uh, the southern state uh, called Kerala, almost in the southwest tip of India. So my dad, uh, you know, had a nursery. He's still actually he's believe it or not, he's he's turning ninety uh, this month. Wow! And uh, he still, you know, goes to the nursery and uh, uh, it's you know it's not as a business but more of a hobby now. But that's that's my ag background, so to speak. So I came to the U.S. in nineteen eighty nine. Um, uh, I did a one-year internship at Longwood Gardens in, uh, in Pennsylvania, um, then did my master's at the University of Florida um, in, in uh, turf grass, uh, you know, management, and then went to Virginia Tech uh, and did my PhD in weed science. Um, so I graduated there in 97 and then uh, did a couple of years of postdoc back at the University of Florida and came to Morgantown in 99. So yeah, so basically, uh, you know, I mean, I really enjoy working with uh, producers. You know, uh, different commodities or in or uh, tree fruits is another area that I work here uh, closely in, in in West Virginia. Um, so yeah, my my, my <laughs> trying to address the weed uh, problems uh, is uh, is my <laughs> favorite thing to do. In terms of my job here, JJ. Yeah, uh, Rakesh, my, I'll tell our anyone our, our audience today that Rakesh is a very valuable asset for the state of West Virginia. I think that almost every ag extension agent could say that uh, we are we're asking advice from Rakesh all the time, no matter if it's for uh, weed identification or recommendations for for control. Um, he's the guy. He's our go-to man. So, and he is, uh, he gets back with you very quickly and we appreciate that. Uh, JD, you wanna go ahead and uh, start us off with some, some questions? 
Definitely. You know, we're going to be kind of covering uh, multi-floor rows and all of, all of uh, control this session here. And, you know, if you've either, either live in West Virginia or just driven through West Virginia, you can kind of pretty much look on any hillside and see one or the other, uh, it seems nowadays. And, and this is a big problem we're facing. And these two guys right here are on the forefront of controlling this problem in, in West Virginia through extension. They've done a lot of research, uh, you know, that, that can, you know, deals with controlling uh, both these species. So we're kind of kicking off, you know, how big of a problem is this? I mean, how, I mean, you know, as far as agriculture goes, you know, how quick does this spread? You know, how soon does, uh, producers need to be looking at forms of control when you start to spot these on your property. Let's just kind of start the basement and go go up. So I, I'll kick that off. Uh, I would say if you don't have these plants on your property and you see them, then the, when you need to start control is, is as soon as you see them immediately because they do spread easily. Uh, so Folks may or may not be aware, of course, we know multiple rose was introduced uh, and autumn olive was also introduced as, as a conservation planting. It was initially brought in to, to try and um, have something to cover up some of these uh, strip mined areas and some of these areas like that. And, and it, it uh, turned out to be well adapted to our climate and our environment. And then just as, uh, of course, the birds can spread the seed easily. And so it, it uh, this time of year, or maybe actually about two weeks ago, is a good time of year to see just how bad the autumn olive problem is, because when it was in bloom, and you could just see it out there on those hillsides, uh, you could, you know, if you weren't sure what the plant, if you're not sure in the middle of the growing season, you can sure tell in the spring when it when it's out there, the you know the main thing that's blooming. So, it's a huge problem. It it evades um, invades pastures readily and so on. And, you know, I don't think it's a, real, a serious problem in well-managed pasture. What I mean by that is if you have, a, you know, if it's, a, if you have something where it's not there already and you, you have a good grazing system and you keep good ground cover, you're probably not get, going to get started. But some, some of our continuous grazed pastures, it, it tend to get openings in the soil and so on where seeds and little plants can germinate, it will get started. And then once it gets started and gets a foothold, it will spread quickly. So um, I, I would uh, definitely take aggressive action if you don't have it, if you start seeing these plants in your pastures. Bruce, uh, the, uh, is it your opinion a lot of times they start in fence rows? Common. Yeah, it, it, that's very common. And I have some pictures where I've taken uh, the low power lines and you think fence rows and power lines, what do they have in common? Well, the, the, the fence row, you can't actually mow under it really, but a power line, where, as you can, power line you can, but the one thing they have in common is birds roosting on them and dropping seeds. And, uh, and so I've seen that power lines where I was just seeing a, a stripe, a strip of uh, brush right under the power line and not nowhere else, even though none of it was mowed. And so, but yeah, fence rows, any place where you can't take any um, kind of uh, mechanical action definitely is a place where they can get, get rolling. And when you're looking at mechanical, I know we'll talk about spraying here in a minute, but you know, how often should we be covering these areas uh, for these plants on these mechanical uh, control methods like mowing so one thing to realize is and I, Rakesh might add to this um, mechanical like mowing any of these these kind of plants is not going to eliminate them what you're doing with that is your is you are controlling the size of them and that's not always a bad thing to at least control the size. And sometimes it's good to get the size down to make it more manageable for herbicides or whatever. But once a year, we'll control the size. You know, if you do multiple times a year, that's gonna, you know, control the size a bit more, but it's not gonna get rid of them still, um, for the most part. I, I've rarely seen where continual mowing will get rid of these unless it's like lawn kind of continual mowing and that's not gonna happen. So. And that's, of course, that's not good for our pastures either. So, you know, once a year is enough just to keep the size down. I don't know, Rakesh, would you add anything to that? I think uh, you, uh, you know, uh, you covered it, Bruce. I mean, it's not, in other words, it's not the most effective way to control it. I mean, theoretically, if you cut back any perennial uh, repeatedly, you know, each time it tries to grow back, it is pulling some of the reserves from the rootstocks 
and then eventually it will die. Uh, but then, you know, it might take, uh, you know, uh, multiple mowing uh, events in fair proximity to each other or I mean, in, in high frequency to accomplish this for these two brushes. So especially for automotive, um, you know, it's, it's, I think it's going to be very difficult to control an established automotive brush or shrub, you know, with, uh, with mowing. Um, <clears throat> and while we're on the mechanical uh, side of things, uh, you know, a lot of producers like to, you know, push them up, you know, if they're clearing some land, push them over with, you know, because they're not really deep rooted plants and they'll push them over and maybe chip them. You know, what have y'all seen uh, as forms? Does that actually work? Is it a little bit more effective than mowing or is it less effective? I mean, what's your opinion on that as far as pushing them up and maybe chipping them? Uh, my, my thing on pushing them up and that kind of thing is long, number one, when doing that kind of activity, just be careful you don't lose topsoil, you know, pushing, you know, if you're using a dozer or track you know, pushing, uh, pushing the soil around, as long as you're not losing soil. I think that's a good practice as long as you realize that when you do that, you are not getting rid of the plant, okay? And what you have to realize when you do that is that is step one. And all you're doing is, Again, it's, it's kind of like mowing, you're getting the size down because you can get done with that process and you think, okay, this looks great. And the next year or year two, it's gonna be a jungle. And so come back, you need to plan on this, come back year one after that. And then you can do, do some applications and be very effective. And it's gonna take a few years, but that, that, that's a good practice as long as you don't think that pushing them up in the pile and chipping them is, is finishing the job. That's right, that's right. Rakesh, I have a follow-up maybe towards the same line of questioning as JD was talking about. If you do go in and, and it's overgrown, no matter if you have multiple rows or automolive, and you brush hog, how soon should you go back in and, and do some kind of uh, chemical control? Yeah, so, uh, <clears throat> you know, the, the any parts of the root system that is left behind, you know, when you either uh, brush hog it or, or push the shrubs, they're going to grow back, right? So as soon as they start new growth or regrowth, and when you have sufficient foliage on them, uh, it may be, you know, practical to go with a backpack and, uh, you know, do a, a foliar application before it gets, you know, over shoulder height uh, so that you can get good coverage. So depending on the time of the year uh, that you push it back and, uh, and, 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 and when it regrows, um, you know, um, the, uh, it might, it, it, even if you apply the herbicide in fall, that should be fine. You know, you still would get control. But the key thing is not to let it reestablish um, and develop those roots again, root system again, um, JJ. Thank you. And with the applications of spraying, there's, there's always different ways to treat these plants, right, Rakesh? You know, we got basil, we got spot, mm -hmm. we got foliar. Uh, go into a little bit about the different ways of treating uh, these these plants chemically. Yeah, uh, um, I'll be happy to get started on that, and then Bruce can chime in. Bruce, um, let me let me pull up this uh, couple of slides that we have specifically for this question. JD, uh, let me just share the screen here. One second. Can you um, enable screen sharing, JJ? Uh, yeah, hold on here. I'll, uh... But yeah, while JJ does that, so you're right, uh, JD. Uh, you know, you the, this basically there's foliar application, which is suited for uh, you know brushes that are not too tall, where you can reach over and get good coverage. And then uh, there's basal application where uh, you can apply it, especially during the dormant time uh, when there is, there is no foliage on plant. That way you can you know, get in there easily uh, and, uh, and get a good you know, uh, application around the entire stem. So that's where you uh, mix uh, either remedy or crossbow with uh, diesel oil or, uh, or mineral oil. Uh, and then spray it to uh, the bottom, uh, you know, 15 to 18 inches or so from the soil level all the way around. Uh, make sure you get good coverage. 
And uh, we'll talk about the mixing ratios and all here in a bit. So that's basal application. And then you have cut stump application where uh, you cut the, uh, you know, the brush back as close as possible to the ground and then do uh, an application of a concentrated solution of the herbicide. And, for, and, and when you do a cut stem application, you can even apply glyphosate, you know, uh, depending on the formulation, you know, one part of glyphosate to two to three parts of water or remedy or crossbow mixed with oil, you know, should do it too. And all you need to do is to, you know, uh, get uh, the chemical on uh, close to the circumference, just on the cambium tissues. So you don't have to spray the entire, uh, you know, uh, cross section to avoid in waste of chemical. Uh, and then be able to some... share now, Rakesh. Okay, thanks. And then uh, you have, uh, you know, uh, uh, soil-based application where materials like spike, which is a um, uh, granulated form formulation of tebuthyrod herbicide. So that can be applied directly to the soil uh, as pellets. And then that will stay there and move, leach into the soil and then be absorbed by the roots you know, to, to enhance kill. So those are some of the, uh, you know, common types of application. And then Bruce will talk about aerial application where you can, you know, for large infestations, uh, you can uh, use a helicopter um, to, again, mix different, uh, you know, some of these active ingredients together and get, and good, and get good control uh, for, uh, for established plantings. Uh, Bruce, do you want to add on to that? Uh, no, I think you covered the different methods pretty good, uh, Rakesh. All right, so can you see my screen now? Yes. Yeah, so these are the basically the herbicides, the uh, trade names or the formulations and on the left-hand column here and the generic names uh, that are active on autumn olive. Um, so if you look at it, you know, the, uh, basically the active ingredients, the most common active ingredient here would be triclopyr, which is present in crossbow and, and, uh, and remedy ultra. And then you have aminopyrrolid, which is uh, there in grace on next um, milestone. Uh, and then picloram. Picloram, as you know, uh, is a restricted use pesticide. So you need an applicator license to uh, purchase this material and to be able to apply it. So that's there in Trodon 22K, um, ready to use formulation. And then uh, Grayson P plus D, which has 240 also in it. And then Surmount, which has fluoroxypyr in addition to picloram. Now the other um, common active ingredient which is effective is metsulfuron. Um, so metsulfuron, you know, as you know, uh, was sold as ally, uh, the herbicide ally several years ago. Um, but now the most common formulations are Cimarron Plus uh, and Chaparral, uh, which has uh, chlorosulfuron and aminopyrrolid in addition to metsulfuron. Now, if you want to get metsulfuron by, by itself, uh, you, it's still around, you can order it online. There are several generic you know, formulations of, uh, of it available, uh, more or less cost-effective uh, too, um, and, and another, uh, uh, formulation or trade name it is sold is escort e s c o r t escort so you can apply metsulfuron by itself uh, along with the non ionic surfactant and still get good control you know in the early stages hey, that, Rikesh, uh, 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 what, just one thing i want to point out on this chart um the one, there's one little error there the cimarron plus is not restricted use i think you carried that down from the picloran products oh okay i'm sorry yeah Thanks for pointing that out. Yeah, Simonon yeah, so, Plus is not, yeah, it's not restricted use. Uh, yeah, all those Pecloran products are, but but Simonon Plus is not. It's not, yeah. That's, ha that's, that's what happens when you copy and paste, uh, Bruce. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Rakesh, a follow-up. And I, I think it's something we need to emphasize to producers. How important is it to add that surfactant in there? Yeah, in that's good, good question. So, uh, in order for the herbicide to break that cuticle barrier to enter the tissues of the plant and to be taken up, absorbed and translocated you know, to different parts of the plant, uh, the, the surfactant uh, you know, does the trick. Um, so, uh, so that what, what it does is it does two things. Uh, it 
uh, spreads the spray droplet. In other words, you have better contact of the spray droplet because if you imagine a spray droplet, it's usually usually spherical, right? So on a leaf surface, if it lands like this, you know there's a little contact uh, with the bottom of the sphere of the droplet. So what uh, the surfactant does is it breaks the surface tension and makes it more flatter. So now you have more surface area contact with the leaf. That is one thing. And the other thing is, uh, you know, especially the oil-based uh, um, adjuvants or surface surfactants, uh, it solubilizes the waxy cuticle, um, allowing the herbicide to penetrate into the leaf tissues better. So it's, yes, it's, it's very important to get uh, and to add the surfactant to uh, the herbicide, and the label will, you know, will let you will indicate what type of surfactant is most effective. And uh, you know, with some of the oil-based formulations like Remedy or Crossbow, uh, which which uh, all uh, which already becomes an emulsion when you mix it with water, uh, it's not as critical to add you know, the, the surfactant. But with some of these other dry materials, it's very important to add uh, the surfactant, uh, JJ. Yeah, so uh, on the right-hand side and on the comments section, that's where you have, uh, you know, the various, uh, uh, the, met uh, the methods or, or the type of application that can be carried out. Um. Bruce, do you have anything more to add? Uh, to this. Uh, now, I just want to point out that Banwell by itself, Dicamba, it, it is labeled for these brushes, but it's not as effective, uh, you know, compared to crossbow or remedy, uh, etc. by itself. Yeah, just looking at this list of products, a, a couple comments. Uh, first off, the, the three Picloran products there in the middle, Tordon, Grazon, and uh, Grazon P plus D, that is, and Surmount, those are all really good, but Number one, they're restricted use, so that's going to greatly reduce the number of people that can use those. They're not as readily available. And so while those are really effective, and if you have a license, they would be something to consider, then they're not used near as much. And so if you look at this list and trying to say, okay, well, this is a lot of different options. What, what, what would you use? What would you recommend? What would you suggest? And I, I think it comes down to, to some looking at things that are readily available and also um, things that people can, um, that are not restricted use. So we're looking probably at using Remedy or Pasture Guard. And so you notice both of those have Triclopyr, Pasture Guard also has Fluoroxapyr. And then mixing those with either Cimarron Plus or Chaparral or, or Grazon Next even. Um, so. Grazon Next and Chaparral both have amino pyrrolid. Um, and then as, as Rakesh said, Cimarron Plus and Chaparral have that sulfuron. And so it, some combination of those mixes, either Remedy, Pasture Guard with Grazon Next, Cimarron Plus or Chaparral uh, have been effective. And, and we're not, I'm not saying 100% removing plants effective, but a, a pretty high percentage, and then usually year two, you can come back in and spot treat and, and remove the, re the remaining plants pretty handily. So that that's kind of what I'd be looking at. And personally, I've been using a lot of uh, Remedy and Chaparral mixes, but, um, uh, or, or, or also Remedy and Cimarron. Those are the two I've used mostly, but uh, um, I know I, I've talked to a number of people that have used some Remedy and Grazon next. They like it real well. Or a, rim, or a pasture guard and, um, and one of the others. So all, all, all the five of those are good in, in combinations in this trying to control autumn olive. And as uh, Bruce you know, mentioned earlier, uh, you know, persistence is the key uh, when it comes to both these brushes, uh, JD. So uh, you know, these, this didn't, these didn't show up in the farm overnight. So it's not going to go away overnight too. Uh, so, in, in some situations, you know, if it's uh, established, uh, it's been there for several years, you know, it may take three to four years, uh, but, but do not get discouraged. Uh, it takes a lot of effort, but then stay after it, um, you know, till uh, you get good control. And you will notice that, you know, progressively it gets better. Uh, after the first year, even under the best, best circumstances, you know, even if you use some of these 
combinations as Bruce mentioned, you know, uh, there may still be some regrowth uh, the following year or two. But then if you stay on top of it, I mean, at the second and third year, you could, uh, you don't have to use these combinations. You could probably use one or two straight active ingredients, you know, depending on the regrowth and, and, and get good control. Uh, and then eventually you will win the game. Cash, I got a question. Uh, you know, we, we do have a treatment that a lot of people in Jackson County like. It's the, the uh, Toradon RTU, ready to use as a drip application for cutting and then sprinkling on. Now, that's not restricted, or is it? It is restricted. Uh, so no, yeah. RTU. no, hey, Rakesh, no, the, the, the Toradon RTU is not. If you go down on your slides to the number seven, Rakesh, just flip through a couple of slides there. Go, go ahead, keep going. One more. And that, so right, that, that's what you're talking about, John David, right? Yes, yes. Okay, that, that product, even though it has pecoram in it, it is not, it is not restricted. Okay. No, thanks for pointing that out. I thought all products which has picloram as an active ingredient was restricted use, um, but maybe, yeah, this is probably not, uh, but that's uh, new to me. Yeah, I think as a ready to use product, it, it's not, um, yeah, I think you're right, Rakesh. Every other picloram product I know of is restricted, but this one is not. And it is, uh, John David, it is really good for these cut stem treatments you're talking about. It's really handy for a person because it is ready to use. You don't have to have any mixes, you don't have to have any sprayers, you don't have to have anything else. And you can take that bottle and a chainsaw and you go out and get to work and, and treat some plants. Um, now, I will say, as a ready-to-use product, it is going to be more expensive than if you would mix, uh, say, Remedy or Crossbow or something with diesel fuel for cut stem treatments or Roundup, whatever. But so if you're doing a lot, I mean, lots and lots and lots of cut stem, then you would be ahead to mix, at least economically. But um, this is a really good product, and it's very convenient to use. Well, that kind of brings me to another question I get all the time. Uh, you know, what is the cheapest way... <laughs> And it's, I tell them, you get what you pay for. Uh, what is the cheapest way? You know, everybody's looking for a, a magical silver bullet that, that takes out everything. So, you know, what, but what is the, I guess, most economic spray uh, that you've seen? Now, I'm not trying to promote one product over another here. You know, that is definitely not, not my intention here. But what is the most economic mixture that you've seen that's out there? What a question, huh, Rakesh? <laughs> I know, yeah, it's, uh, that's the... That's a tough that, one, I know. That's a tough one, yeah, that's why I was keeping quiet here for a moment, it, it, hoping that Bruce would pick it up. Uh, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll take a stab here it, and yeah. tell you the, the standard thing, it depends. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> because really, here's the thing, JD, if you have large, lots of large plants, it's may, what's going to be the cheapest and best way to attack it may be different than if you have, uh, say, five foot plants. Because if you have uh, lots of small young plants like that, by far the cheapest, best way to attack is with a foliar spray. Because if you go in with a, a basil spray or, or chainsaw and, and cut stem spray, not only will you drive yourself insane, you will be putting a lot of product down per acre and, and, it's, and it's going to be expensive. But uh, that is an ideal situation to cheaply do a foliar spray using something like um, Remedy, Cimarron mix, or something like that. Uh, if you have lots of large plants and, uh, you know, tall plants, 10 feet or more, 15 feet tall and so on, where foliar, even if you can do it, you know, physically, if it's possible to do it foliar, it's going to be, it's going to take a lot of, it's going to take a lot of spray to cover those plants. Okay. So then you're starting to get work the other way in that application. And in that case, a lot of times you're more, uh, it's more economical to do a cut stem. This is a picture of a, of a cut stem. That's not an autumn olive, but that is a, a cut stem and it shows the, the treatment around the edges there. You're more economical either do that or a basil spray. So it's kind of like, it, it, think of it this way, stems per acre. Uh, and so, you know, a lot, a lot of stems per acre, that, that's small plants. Usually foliar is going to be cheaper. If it's few stems per acre, that's big plants. It's going to be usually a basil or a cut stem is going to be cheaper. Although that that's physically, that's not always possible. I'm talking about 
if you have acres, which we'll show you here, another way you can control large plants, um, maybe not the cheapest way, but way it can be done. I mean, if you have acres and acres of large plants, you may not just physically be able to get over that and do all that uh, with a basal spray or cut stem. So yeah, I think uh, Bruce covered it well. So it, it's on a case by case basis on a, or a situation basis, uh, you know, so if it's, um, if it's just a few plants, then yeah, either foliar application or, um, you know, basal uh, cut stem, those, those would work depending on the size of the plant. Uh, so, hey, Rakesh, back up one slide. And, and guys, let me just talk about this briefly because we've done some helicopter applications in, in the central part of the state for several years, starting this, this what's on this slide here was done in 2014. And uh, I don't want to uh, talk about helicopter applications as something everybody needs to do, or this is the end all, or it's definitely not the silver bullet. Uh, you're talking about that because there is no silver bullet, but this, it's a tool. And it, it, in, some, in certain cases, it is, it's a good option if you can get a company into your area to get it done. So um, right near Jane Lou, we did this uh, in 2014 using this mix here. And that company that year was using this uh, Tordon K, which has the Picloram, you may recall. Garlon 4 is the same as Remedy and then uh, surfactant. And so if you go uh, then to the next picture, uh, Rakesh, um, I think that was the one that was showing where the helicopter, that, that was actually on the site and they just had the spray mix in that truck and they would land on the truck and fill the tank up and go back out. And you know that the helicopter can only hold like uh, 50 or 60 gallons at a time. So it's only spraying three or four or five acres at a time. There, there's a site we had and you see that autumn olive, all that, all that lower shrub is all, is almost solid autumn olive. And just so you know, this is a site where that had been cut back uh, with a brush hog a few years before and it looked fantastic right after they cut it. But then this is what came back almost as if, as if it had been planted. And so notice that, that path up through the middle of this picture where that road is, or that, it, it doesn't look like a road, but there's a path there because the next few pictures, keep that road in mind. And this is what the site looks like. That, there was a year after, okay, that was a year after. So you see, we still had, no, that actually wasn't a year after. That was more like the same season right there. So then go to the next one, Rakesh. And that picture we took at the same site uh, this, this, this last, earlier this week. So that path, that road up the middle is that path. So what they did there at that site was they sprayed that in 2014 and they came back and sprayed the, all the same acreage again with a broadcast coverage, not a spot treatment, broadcast coverage in 2015. And then they haven't done anything else, done nothing else. And that's what they have. Now, what they need to do is they need to go in, you see those bushes coming back there, those spots here and there, they need to go in with a spot treatment and, and, and spray those because over time, we know those are gonna build back up. And then, you know, if you wait until they get enough to do a helicopter application again, then you have uh, a lot of expense and you also are treating the whole area which you're killing clover and so on and so forth. So um, my recommendation is after you have something like that done to get the, get the plants down, then you come back in and spot treat. But it, it, it can't, this, these pictures just showed a small area of this. We're talking, this was hundreds of acres of this plant, of this, of this infestation here. So it, it did a, uh, uh, that's how you can change your pasture with that. And it doesn't have to be a helicopter. You can do the same, a similar thing with your own, your, your, your own equipment, but that's just one tool to use. And for, for those who's listening and, and not able to, view this you know it's it's is what he just showed is tremendous i mean it's solid all of all and uh then you know within two years you see a lot of grass a lot of pasture coming back and for for you guys that may be traveling up through jane lou once you get was it north right north of the truck stop it's south actually we just right south of the truck yeah. stop well, if you look up all the, all these ridges, you'll see, you know, some of these strips that they've sprayed and you kind of see, you'll see a dead tree here and there kind of sprinkled in there that might have been a non-target, uh, but just kind of got in with the mix. And you'll see these big strips that, that you can see where they sprayed and it's, it's very tremendous. You can see it from the highway and we were up there earlier in the week and it was very impressive and, and I applaud uh, both these guys here for taking on this challenge and, and trying to control that. John David, those trees that you see dead in those spray areas were most, uh, well, practically all those were not 
were not non-target. They were targeted. Okay. Because they were not forced in areas. They were just places where there were just scrap trees and so on. And they just said, spray it all. And they, and they killed most of those trees when they did that then. Okay. Well, they, they done a good job then. Too. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You almost had a silver bullet there. <laughs> <laughs> so, J.D., you asked about costs. Uh, so this is an example where if you have a large infestation, uh, you know, this method aerial application is probably the most cost effective. So Bruce, uh, can you talk about the cost? I mean, how much they typically charge for, you know, some, something of this nature with helicopter application? Sure. Yeah. So when we're back in 2014 and 15, that cost, it, it varied a little bit. It ranged from somewhere around $110 to $125 an acre. And we had a lot of different landowners use that service over the few years after that. And some of them paid more than that because they were a little more remote. In other words, they didn't have as many acres and they were cut off by themselves and it cost more for the company to spray. That company that did that spraying back then is, is no longer coming to our area. And in 2020, we started working with a different company called Helicopter Applicators from Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. And they, they sprayed about 1,500 acres in this part of the state last year. And they charged $90 an acre. They're going to spray again this year here in about two weeks, and they're, they're going to charge $100 an acre this year. So the difference is their, their spray, they did not include, include any Picloran products in their spray mix. So they sprayed Remedy and Chaparral last year. And uh, yeah, right there's the mix, a uh, uh, pint and a half of Remedy per acre and three ounces of Chaparral per acre. And then in 2021, they're going to use a, a pint and a half of Pasture Guard and three ounces of Chaparral in their mix. And it says mixture used, but it hasn't been used yet. It's, got, it's coming up here soon. Did, did we lose Bruce? Excuse, excuse me? Bruce, sounds like you're cutting out there. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, you're good. Okay, so anyway, uh, uh, about, so this year the charge is going to be $100 an acre, and so it, the, the key is to have enough acres to get a, a company to come, be interested to come to your area, and if, if you have, you know, the, if you think about that cost, $90, $100 an acre, if you have a large area that, uh, that you need to get under control, it's you know, it, it can be worth it in certain cases. Good deal. And, uh, you know, I always have these questions as well. Uh, you know, looking at different, uh, the different sprays and, and the strengths and everything, was there much of, uh, you know, personal protection equipment uh, needed for some of these? I mean, they're, they're not that dangerous of sprays, but we still need to take caution. Uh, you know, with with our, our well-being and, you know, we, we talked about men's health and everything and uh, the other day in, in one of our conferences, uh, you know, what's some of the, you know, more aggressive ones or, you know, is there ones that you, you kind of see out there that maybe takes a little bit more personal equipment, uh, pr protection equipment? What, what have you seen with these products as far as that goes? I think um, Rakesh may correct me on this. I think everything on the list that he put up there on that previous slide, the personal protective equipment for all those, I believe, is is uh, long sleeves, long pants, shoes, socks, you know, gloves, and protective eye, something to protect your eye, your eyesight. I believe that's it for all those. Do you know of anything different than that, Rakesh? I think you got it right. Um, um, but to answer that question, JD, I mean, I, if I were to err, uh, I would, uh, I would err on the side of safety. So if it's, uh, unless the, it's an extremely hot day and you know, you have all the Tyvex food and all that, you know, it's going to be, uh, you know, uh, put you, put your, I mean, raise your body temperature too much. Yeah, I would uh, make sure that, you know, especially if you're applying large areas uh, uh, with sprayer, have a Tyvex suit on, you know, a pair of gloves, you know, um, and, and boots uh, and then you know wear a hat um, and we are all used to wearing masks by now so <laughs> you know it wouldn't hurt to wear a mask because you know that way you inhale uh, you know as little, little vapor or, or you know spray droplets <laughs> as possible so yeah so that's I think that uh, we take as much safety precautions as possible although the label 
you know, would say uh, to wear a long sleeve shirt, a pants, uh, and, and then some cases gloves. Um, but yeah, I think it's, a, it's, it's good to get into the habit of, I mean, you don't have to wear, I mean, wear a, you know, what do you call a respirator or anything like that, but you know, anything that you can get, to, get your hands on easily to, you know, to cover your body as much as possible would be, would be good. Okay. I just wanted to put that plug in there. Cause you know, we always, we're here seeing the commercials about roundup and everything else on, on television. So really need to keep that in mind as too. JJ, what you got? Hey, this may be a question for, for Bruce or Rakesh, as far as maybe we'll switch gears a little bit. What about uh, anyone that wants to use a, a more natural approach? They want to use uh, sheep and goats to, <clears throat> as maybe some mixed species grazing. Or as we had talked before the program started, there are, I don't know if there's any really close to us, but there are some uh, farmers that have herds of goats that will they have a business where they go out and clear these areas. Um, mm -hmm. what, are, what are some of your thoughts on that as far as using sheep and goats? Yeah, I can get started on that, um, uh, JJ. So you, you mentioned an important term here, you know, mixed species grazing. So uh, in early stages of infestation, uh, if you have small ruminants, especially goats, they do a really good job of going after some of these brushes uh, when they're small enough where they can reach you know, the top and, uh, and grace them entirely. They do a jo good job, especially multiflora rose. Uh, they uh, are it's highly on their list of preferred species in terms of forage. Uh, sheep uh, also do well, uh, not as aggressive as, as goats. Um, with autumn olive, um, when I was, uh, as I mentioned before we started this presentation, um, show here. Uh, it, autumn uh, grow goats. You know, if you if you if you can cut the branches down, um, you know, the goats will go after it. If there is nothing else in terms of brushes there in the pasture, so uh, but then they they don't voraciously feed on autumn olive as they would on multiflora rose. But yeah, otherwise, uh, if you if you if you're able to manage. Uh, some of the small ruminants in your uh, system, uh, you know, if you can combine mixed species grazing in your system, that would uh, definitely keep these pressures at bay. And J JJ, I, I would add to that, regardless of what you're grazing, whether it's uh, just cattle or whatever it is, if you have the better managed your pastures are, the better, the, the less uh, or the easier it is then to after you've eliminated some of these plants to keep them out. So what I mean by that is if you have pastures that where you have a rotation and the grass, the forages you want have a chance to send down roots to compete against all the weeds and everything else, you'll get a better canopy cover and you'll have less weed problems and less brush problems than if you have a continuous grazed pasture where they're continually eating and the grass down and it cannot compete. And, and you're just going to keep having to keep spray these over and over. Uh, over time, in a, in a rotation, you'll not, that won't eliminate it, but it, it will help with all your weed problems, brush and herbaceous weeds. That's a good, yeah, that's a good point. So, um, you know, simple things like pH, you know, if, if, it's, if, it's, if it's acidic, add some, throw some test, have a soil test and, uh, you know, uh, add, uh, add some lime or throw some lime to uh, increase the pH to 6.5, that area, 6 to 6.5, um, you know, so that your grasses are encouraged, are favored um, to grow, to cover the, keep the soil surface covered as Bruce mentioned. And also some of these deep rooted, uh, you know, perennials, uh, if you have, you know, uh, you know brambles or hemp dog bait, sometimes that can be an indication of poor management or poor uh, or not, uh, favorable favorable pH because they tend to you know, the, the 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 deep roots tend to indicate that uh, you know there is uh, the grasses are not able to get nutrients from the surface right that's when the these pressures become a problem so yeah good management uh, you know if it's a hay field uh, don't cut it don't cut it too low to the ground. Um, what else, Bruce? I mean, fert uh, fertilizer application. If the fertilizer, I mean, if the fertility is low, make sure that uh, you know nutrients are uh, are um, 
you know, included uh, or thrown back to the system because you know even if it's pasture or hay, you know, uh, each time there's a, a grazing event or when you cut it for hay, you're removing removing nutrients, right? So you need to recycle or put those nutrients back into the pasture. So uh, that is also something to keep in mind. Hey, John, David, uh, when we talked the other day, you asked me a question um, and and I told you I'd talk about it today and I haven't yet. So um, on herbicide labels, they they they're all they all have their rates per acre, which is which is good. But a lot of us, when we're spraying brush, we're not spraying a broadcast spray, which is, which is where you're trying to cover all every square foot of a field in a, in a broadcast spray. And we're a lot of times we're using a spot spray. So you're mixing up a tank and you want to just go spray certain brush like in this picture that we saw earlier that had you know scattered brush here and there you just want to spray spray those and some labels have a, a really good about the mixture for a spot spray and some are not so remedy for instance it says right on the label for a spot spray you mix it at a half a percent herbicide 0.5 percent herbicide okay it says right on the label great that's perfect um cimarron does not have it on the label and uh, John David and I talked about this the other day. I told him I'd tell you all today what to mix for a spot spray using Cimarron. And that rate is one ounce. Now, keep in mind, Cimarron is a, is a, gr a granular that dissolves in water. So it just comes in a small bottle and it comes with a measuring flask. And so you measure using that little flask um, the, the, uh, the amount. So it's one ounce per 100 gallons, one ounce per 100 gallons. And then if you have a smaller sprayer, uh, let's say a four wheeler sprayer, that 15 gallons, for instance, then you just do the math, like um, a 15 gallon sprayer would be 0.15 ounces. And you think, well, that's ridiculous to measure that, but that little measuring device, you can measure that small amount out, that's what it's for. And so you, you, again, it's one ounce per 100 gallons, that's the base rate, and then you figure based on whatever size you have. Now, I think Chaparral, I believe it actually is on the label, but I will tell you for brush, what the rate I uh, use for brush on a spot spray with Chaparral is 3.3 ounces per hundred gallons. And again, that is, um, that, that Chaparral is also a granular, which comes with the measuring flask that and it dissolves in water. So 3.3 ounces per hundred gallons. And like I say, my 15 gallon four wheeler sprayer that works out to 0 0.49, which is basically 0.5, a half an ounce in, in 15 gallons. So, Th those are kind of your base rates. I think the rest of them, all the liquids, I'm thinking of a pasture guard and um, remedy and crossbow and all those others, I think they have a spot rate on the label. Yeah, and also uh, with some of these dry formulations, as you pointed out earlier, um, you know, adding a surfactant is important, right? So uh, usually the rate for a non-ionic surfactant is one quart per 100 gallons of water, one quart, that is 0.25% volume by volume. So one quart is 32 ounces. Uh, so if you have smaller, you know, uh, tank capacities, you, you know, do the math so that, you know, it's uh, at the rate of one quart per hundred gallons of water. And, and usually in, in general, you know, with uh, the liquid formulations, uh, one quart per acre, the label says one quart per acre uh, the, on a, for a broadcast application that, uh, the, uh, that equates to approximately one per, uh, one percent solution. Uh, so, you know, use that as a general reference. One quart per acre is 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 about a one percent solution for you know for smaller tank mixes. Yeah, and to add to that, Bruce, the I got into an argument with another extension agent, and those the the little measuring things that come with the the dry formulations, those are about spot on per because we've taken that much and dumped it on a scientific um, scale. And that's almost exactly the same. Um, you know, some of that stuff is expensive, but when it, if you measure that out with those, that little cylinder they, they give you, those, those things are almost right on. Yeah, I would not apply a Cimarron or Chaparral without using that measuring device that comes with them because you, you, it just, it keeps you right tuned in exactly the right amount, it keeps you from wasting money and wasting herbicide. Thank you oh, all yeah. for talking about measuring because, you know, we, we should be measuring in cups, not glugs. I know That's a lot right. of people, they just, you know, I put three glugs in there. 
Yeah. You know, what's a glug? <laughs> you know? well, they, or they add a little extra. They're like, well, you know, a little extra won't hurt. Well, well more's better, right? Yeah. <laughs> not dealing yeah. with laundry detergent here. Yeah, I refer, I mean, I call it recreational spray. You know, just go out there and spray a whole bunch. But you, uh, and you, uh, again, you know, uh, the point when you need to stop spraying is bef just before it begins to drip. You want to get good coverage, but not to a point of drip to the, to the ground. And I, right, I would also add, if, if you have people that are doing broadcast sprays for, for brush or anything else, uh, using a, a traditional boom or a boomless nozzle, then it's really critically important that they calibrate their sprayer. And of course, calibration is not a, a big deal if you don't spot spray because you're, you get the mix right in the tank, as we just talked about, and then you're spraying the brushes as Rakesh just described. But on a broadcast spray, calibration is critical. And if you don't know how much liquid your sprayer is delivering per acre, you're not getting the job done right. And if you're not sure how to do that, contact your extension agent, they can help you. All right. And I have a couple of questions I always ask all of our guests. You know, uh, Rakesh, there's two types of music, country and Western. So uh, do you have a, a favorite country music artist, Rakesh? Uh, I knew you'd go. You, you would ask that question. Uh, I mean, I like country. <laughs> I like country music. Every once in a while, I listen to you know a good number. Uh, Bruce, I'm sorry, JJ, but uh, I, I prefer. I mean, I like uh, uh, you know classic rock. I mean, you know, oh, okay. people like um, if you want, if you want to ask a favorite artist of mine, that would be Led, Led Zeppelin. Oh, uh, exactly. <laughs> Yesterday I was putting out some uh, in a plot near core, um, and so there's this, uh, you know, uh, 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 this producer. Um, and he seemed to be like an old timer, you know, uh, and he was he was beginning big time into attending co you know concerts and all that. So I asked him if if he went to Woodstock. <laughs> <laughs> what he say? <laughs> no, he said uh, he wished he did, but he, you know, he did not. Uh, but uh, you know, if I were here uh, back then, I would have definitely, you know, gone to upstate New York to that farm where it. they had Woodstock. <laughs> Led Zeppelin, Bruce, who's your favorite country artist? Well, JJ, I'm old school, nitty gritty dirt band. There we go. What's your favorite song? Oh, I tell you, I don't know. I have a, I have lots of them. I, I like with, from them. Uh, have you ever? Uh, have you ever? Have you had their Circle the Unbroken albums? Yeah, <clears throat> that's that's a really good one. Yeah, they're, they're really good. Well, that that's really old timey. There, they pulled yep. back all those old artists. Yeah, we had a. Uh, this is the second time in a row. Last week we had someone said uh, Ronnie Millsap was their favorite. So really, really hitting the the classic country there. Um, Okay, uh, JD, you have anything out? We have some more. Uh, well, we let's uh, let's open it up a little bit. We haven't asked the participants here that's kind of joined in with us. Uh, you know, our other guests here. Is there any questions? Chime in here if if you do have any questions here. I think we covered. Uh, you know, the types of spraying, the rates, the uh, the you know, actually names of the products that we can and that's available to control these. I think we we done a good job there. So if there's no questions, uh, I'd really yeah. like to thank both of you guys for joining in on the Mountaineer Farm Talk here and uh, the voice of West Virginia Agriculture. You left that off at the beginning there, JJ. Oh, I did? Hey, I, yeah. I, I had a couple more points. Um, I think that what... Uh, Bruce was saying really hits home for a lot of different topics that we talk about. I always tell my producers, um, well, like a lawyer, if you ask a lawyer a question, they would say, well, it depends. And I think it's the same thing. We're talking about autumn olive and, and multiple rows and other issues that we have. Um, it's not something that that's going to go away quickly that, uh, that each farm and, and each landowner, it depends on the situation. And then that's what we're here for is to, uh, to give them some information of what their situation is and go from there. Um, it's a process. Is that right, Bruce? That is. You got it, JJ. So, and we're, and I always tell people, I may not know the answer, but I know somebody who does. <laughs> <laughs> right. Isn't that right, JD? 
That's right. If you met, if you ever meet a man that tells you he knows everything, he's either uh, he's either a liar or a fool. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And we just want to make a uh, a plug too. Next week we have uh, Dr. Lewis Jett is going to be on with uh, heirloom vegetables. And if anyone's not familiar with uh, Lewis, has done several research trials with uh, heirloom beans, especially pole beans in in Appalachia. So we'll be hitting that topic, and and I know that a lot of people, a lot of our gardeners, backyard gardeners, and are very interested in growing heirlooms. So we'll hit that topic hard next week. So um, we appreciate our guests being on today. Anything else, JD? Oh, I think we covered it pretty good, and we appreciate y'all coming out and and uh, you know recording this with us. And if we don't see you sooner. We'll see you later. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for the information. You're welcome.